we're going to take a look at some examples of IXL 8th grade level EE.8, which is the probability of independent and dependent events. So um, independent events, just for some vocabulary, independent one action does not cause another action to happen or it does not affect it at all. Um, and so an independent event would be like flipping a coin uh, several times. If you flip the coin the first time, what you get the first time does not affect in any way what you get the second time you flip the coin. Or another common example is rolling a die. Um, if you roll a die, um, the first roll does not affect what you get the second time you roll it. So those are what we call independent events. Dependent events are like this first question that we have here. Um, so a dependent event, one action affects the second one. So if we take a look at this, um, you pick a card at random, and then it says without putting the first card back. So because we're not putting the first card back, that's going to affect what we can get the second time around. Um, so without putting the first card back, you pick a second card at random. The nice thing about this, though, is the probabilities and setup for at least these problems in IXL end up being pretty similar. And so um, for probability, we're going to set it up as a fraction. And these fractions we of possibilities for the event we want over the total number possible. So if I write that out, it might look something like this. And we call each of these um, occurrences, we call them events. So let's take a look at our events. So here we have the probability of picking up a 6 and then picking up an 8. And so because there are two different actions, we're going to have two different fractions. We'll start with the probability of picking up a 6. So for a 6, there's a one out of four chance that we could get six. So we write one out of four, that's our first fraction. And then we're going to multiply that times the probability of the second event. So our second event is picking up an eight, but remember we did not put it back. So that six is out of there and now we only have three different cards we could use to get an eight. So it's times one out of three because there's one eight out of three total cards left. And then finally, we can go ahead and multiply those. When you're multiplying fractions, multiply straight across. One times one is one and four times three is 12. And so our probability, since they want it written as a fraction or a whole number, is one out of 12. We can submit that and there we go. <clears throat> okay, so here, now we've got a die. And so this is going to be an example of an independent event because our first roll does not affect the second roll. So um, we rolled it two times, that's helpful to know. And then it says, what is the probability of rolling a one and then rolling a four? So we'll start with the first event. Um, the probability of rolling a 1, there is one side out of six sides total that has a 1 on it. And then the second time we roll it, there are still six sides total. Um, and 4 is on one of those sides. So this side is the only side of the die that has 4. So it's 1 chance out of 6 chances to get a 4. And so that's how we'll set it up and then multiply straight across. One times one is one. Six times six is 36. And so that is our probability. <clears throat> Let's see what they give us next. Oh, good. So here's a spinner problem. So with the spinner, again, this would be an example of an independent event um, because you cannot get rid of any of the sections of the spinner. So it'll always be out of four total. 
So we want to know what is the probability of landing on a 9 and then landing on a 7. So we'll start with a 9. On this spinner, there's only one 9. So there's one chance out of four total spots that we could get a 9. And then we'll move on to the probability of landing on a 7. Again, the 7, there's one spot out of four total spots it could land on. So we've got 1 fourth times 1 fourth, and you get 1 sixteenth. Um, and again, they ask us to write it as a fraction or a whole number, so we'll go ahead and write in that answer. And there we go. With those spinner problems, sometimes you want to be careful. I don't think IXL is tricky like this, but I know I've seen some problems maybe on like the SAT, ACT, something like that, where they will put nine and multiple spots. And so you just have to be careful. Sometimes that nine maybe shows up several different times. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Um, <clears throat> so we pick a part, card at random with out, putting the first card back, you pick a second card at random. So remember, if we're not putting it back, our first answer is, go or our second answer is going to depend, depend on the first one. So this is a dependent event. I wish that would write in. There we go. Um, so we'll look at the first one. What's the probability of picking a four and then picking a number greater than three? So here we're going to pick a four. The four is one out of three total cards. So our first probability is one out of three. Then that's times. Then we want to know we didn't put the card back. So we marked out that four. What is the probability of picking a number greater than three? So looking at the two remaining cards, are any of those numbers greater than three? And no. 3 equals 3. 3 is not greater than 3, so that doesn't work. So there is 0 cards out of 2 cards that um, we could get for picking a number greater than 3 if we don't put a number back. And so if we go ahead and multiply these, 1 times 0 is 0, two, 3 times 2 is 6. But you might remember your um, middle school rhyme, if 0 is on the top, then 0 is what you've got. So here, zeros on the top, zeros what we've got. And so our answer is zero. So just be aware that it's possible to have a zero probability. Okay, so here's a coin problem. So we want to know what's the probability of getting tails and then getting tails. So the first time you flip the coin, there's a one out of two chance that you could get tails because one side is tails, and then there are two total sides. And then the second time you flip it, one side doesn't magically disappear. There are still two sides. So there's one side that is tails out of two sides total. We can go ahead and multiply those. One times one is one over two times two is four. Here's the last tricky thing that IXL throws in to these types of problems. So it asks you to write your answer as a percentage. And if you don't automatically know what one fourth is as a percentage, grab a calculator and type in one divided by four. And then you should get the decimal 0 0.25. And then to make that a percent, you're going to take 0 0.25 times 100, or if you move, learn to move the decimal trick, there, um, you're going to move the decimal two places to the right, and your answer is 25%. So if they ask you to change it to a front percentage, divide the numerator by the denominator, so 1 divided by 4, you get a decimal, move that decimal point two places to the right, or multiply by 100, it's the same. There are two different ways to do the same exact thing. Either way, our final answer is 25%. So that should be the extent of the different types of problems IXL throws at you. If you've got questions,